Good morning. This goes to half past the hour, right? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Always like to check that. I hate the method where you have to preach till someone falls out the window. I've uh, never been good at the aftermath. Anyway, 1 Peter chapter 4 is where we want to begin. 1 Peter chapter 4. And may I say by way of disclaimer that I've heard Brother Lyman speak many times, or a number of times, let's say, and I've always profited thereby. He's a very good speaker, and I shan't be offended if tomorrow you say, you know, I want to go to that other class and check it out. And if you want to come back on Wednesday and see what I'm doing, that's fine. Or if you just decide you want to be up there with him, that's okay too. So there's no uh, hurt feelings. You can go where you like. If you must sleep during my message, I just ask that you don't snore. And preferably not drool on your neighbor, okay? Bad form. For, especially in these days. I mean, that's got to be communicable, right? First Peter chapter 4, verse 19. And our broad theme this week is the faithfulness of God. So we're going to look at God's faithfulness in four main areas. Today we're going to think about God's faithfulness in creation. Tomorrow, God's faithfulness in salvation. The third day, we're going to think about God's faithfulness in the high priesthood that He's established. And finally, God's faithfulness in judgment. And I'm hoping, although they are very big subjects and that the greatest minds in the history of the church have been occupied with thinking about these things, I'm hoping that we'll see some very practical things for our daily lives that come out of these truths. Okay, you should be at 1 Peter 4.19 by now. 1 Peter 4.19 Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as to a faithful Creator. And that's a phrase I like to think of. When I think about the faithfulness of God in creation, Peter explicitly says here, of course, by inspiration of the Spirit, that God is a faithful creator. Now, the Bible doesn't set out to prove that God is the creator. The Bible just assumes it. After all, it's in the very first sentence of the Bible, isn't it? You could quote it for me. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And Ecclesiastes 3 tells us that God has set eternity in our hearts. So intuitively, human beings know that there must be something more than the material creation around us. And that there must be someone who has made us. Now we know that, but there are a lot of people, of course, today that deny that. Do they deny that because the facts... The data, so to speak, lead them there? No, my good man over this way is shaking his head vigorously and that's appropriate. No, it's that they have a presupposition as they come to the data. As uh, one of the famous Huxley family, not the, uh, not the Huxleys of Bill Cosby show fame, but the earlier Huxleys, Sir Thomas Huxley was called Darwin's bulldog in the 19th century. And two of his, I believe they were grandsons, Aldous Huxley, wrote the famous novel Brave New World, which is kind of one of those dystopian books that gets mentioned along with Orwell's 1984. And you may hear a lot of people making comparisons to that in our days of artificial intelligence and quarantines and uh, the whole civil liberties debate and so forth. But anyway, Aldous and his brother Julian were both staunch agnostics. In fact, their grandfather, Sir Thomas Huxley, coined the word agnostic. It's a Greek word. It means, I don't know. And they realized that the atheist position was kind of easy to shut down because the Christians kept telling them, you know, really to say that there is no God, philosophically speaking, that means you have to know everything about the universe, everything about history. And so they they kind of realized that. So they thought they'd be clever. They said, well, we just don't know. Meanwhile, the way they live, of course, is practical atheism. And, And Julian Huxley, who was a scientist himself, said very candidly, we didn't want there to be a God. We didn't want the world to be like that. There's been others like Harvard University's Richard Lewinton who said we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. 
So the statement right at the start of it is, no matter what we discover, no matter what we find, it's not God, okay? You can't acknowledge God. And what does the Bible say about a person like that? Well, it says it twice, so we get it. Psalm 14.1 and Psalm 53.1, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And what the Bible means by fool is not someone who's unintelligent or even unlearned, but it means someone who refuses to use the brain that God gave them to come to a reasonable conclusion. And we know it intuitively that there must be more than this life. Brother Kleinman said last night in the message about that salesman who said, you know, my heart is so empty. I mean, the eye is not full of seeing, the ear not with hearing. Uh, As Mick Jagger sang before I was born over 50 years ago, I can't get no satisfaction. Apologize for the double negative and it should have been in Spanish, then it would have been appropriate. But anyway, I can't get no satisfaction and poor Mick is still strutting around in his 70s singing that song because he hasn't found it yet, has he? And he's not alone. Humanity, without knowing God can't be satisfied. They can't be at what the Bible would call peace. One of Ravi Zacharias' early books, his second one, I believe, was called Can Man Live Without God? Excellent book. I recommend it. But in case you don't have time to read it, I'll just answer the question. No. (laughs) Man can't live without God, at least not what God calls living. Not what is really a life worth living. The Lord Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. So you may exist. And sadly, there are lots of people walking around out there existing. They're taking their breaths and they're thinking thoughts and they're doing deeds and they're accomplishing many things. Some of them moral things, some of them immoral things. But from an eternal perspective, they're missing their reason for being. They're missing the whole reason they're here. Because until we get back to the faithfulness of our God in creation, that number one, He's been faithful to make us. Number two, He's been faithful to keep that life going. We're missing the boat on why we're here. We don't know where, we come, where we've come from. We don't know why we are here. And we certainly can't know where we're going unless we know God. And it all comes back to his creation. Now that's why this is one of the most attacked truths in the world today. That people do not want to admit a creator. At least if they admit some kind of a creator, they don't want it to be the God of the Bible. Isn't it funny how people like Carl Sagan, the late uh, astrophysicist from Carl, uh, from Cornell, sorry, I'll get, should have had more coffee. I'll get going here. I'm like, like brother Eric, I'm not a morning person. So anyway, I like you more and more, brother. But anyway, Carl Sagan of Cornell used to say that the universe is all that there is or was or ever shall be. That's how he began the original Cosmos program on PBS. And he wrote a lot of books to that effect. But the interesting thing is, kind of pushing God out of the universe and saying there's no God, uh, Sagan really wasn't content with that. He said there's got to be intelligent life out there. So he was one of the people that spearheaded the efforts to lobby the United States government to form SETI, which is the name of an ancient Egyptian deity, but actually in English it's an acronym for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And for about my lifetime now, they've been pointing satellite dishes up to the sky, trying to listen for meaningful impulses, meaningful sounds, some kind of message from space. Because they say, you know, in this vast universe, we certainly cannot be alone. Well, there we agree, okay? We just disagree on whom we're listening for. He's listening for Marvin the Martian. Greetings, Earthling, take me to your leader. Oh, dear, dear, dear. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, We're listening, though, for the voice of God, right? And the Bible tells us that God has already spoken. Hebrews 1 says, God, having spoken in many parts and many ways to the fathers in the prophets of old, hath in these last days spoken unto us in His Son. 
So God has spoken in the one whom John calls the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that Word, so that we could know the Father, that Word came down amongst us. John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt or pitched His tent amongst us. He tabernacled amongst us. And therefore He could say, He that hath seen Me hath seen the Father in John 14. And Colossians 1 says of Him, He's the image of the invisible God. Now, when we think about him as a faithful creator, we think about, first of all, the fine tuning of this universe. And I am not a science guy. I wish my brother-in-law Andy were here. He'd be a lot better at this than I am. And some of you, no doubt, are accomplished in math and the sciences. And that's not me. So I'll just come clean about that. But I do read people that know about science. And I'll just lay a few quotes on you. And I have a few more. If you want to see me afterwards, I can email them to you or I can show them to you on paper. But Paul Dirac, I don't even know if I'm saying his name right, but he is considered maybe the second greatest physicist of the 20th century after a fellow called Einstein, whom you've probably heard of, right? Now, Dirac, who uh, did his work in England, he was sharer in the Nobel Prize, I think in 1933, with Irving, Irvin Schrodinger, who uh, apparently had a cat, but anyway... Okay, no physicists in the group, because that was a physics joke. There's a famous philosophy experiment, a physics experiment called Schrodinger's Cat. Never mind. Anyway, uh, he shared the Nobel Prize with, with Schrodinger, so he was a smart guy. Now, this is what Dirac said in 1963. There's one other line along which one can still proceed by theoretical means. It seems to be one of the fundamental features of nature that fundamental physical laws are described in terms of a mathematical theory of great beauty and power, needing quite a high standard of mathematics for one to understand it. You may wonder, why is nature constructed along these lines? One can only answer that our present knowledge seems to show that nature is so constructed. We simply have to accept it. One could perhaps describe the situation by saying, that God is a mathematician of a very high order, and he used very advanced mathematics in constructing the universe. Our feeble attempts at mathematics enable us to understand a bit of the universe, and as we proceed to develop higher and higher mathematics, we can hope to understand the universe better. Now, Dr. Dirac was not a believer. He was not even a theist, as far as I'm aware, in the sense that we would understand it. Nor was Einstein. You often hear him quoted saying, God doesn't play dice. And uh, he was more of a pantheist, the people that really know Einstein's thoughts. So he kind of equated the universe itself with God, that there was some kind of overarching reality that Einstein couldn't get to. And Dirac is basically saying the same thing. Now, a quote from a believer, our contemporary brother in the Lord, John Lennox, an Oxford mathematician, he said, talking about Stephen Hawking, the late physicist who said that gravity explains why the universe is here. So we don't need God, we've got gravity. Okay, that, that'd be a great bumper sticker, wouldn't it? Who needs God? Got gravity or something? I mean, he thought it was convincing, but it's rubbish. But anyway, Lennox says this, Much of the rationale between Hawking's argument lies in the idea that there's a deep-seated conflict between science and religion. But this is not a discord I recognize. For me, as a Christian believer, the beauty of the scientific laws only reinforces my faith in an intelligent, divine, creative force at work. The more I understand science, the more I believe in God, because of my wonder at the breadth sophistication, and integrity of his creation. Now, this reminds us of what so much of the scripture says, right? That Psalm 19.1 tells us, the heavens declare the glory of God. Speaking of the heavens, the astrophysicist um, of Arizona State University, Paul Davis, again, a man who is an avowed enemy of intelligent design and Christianity, but he nevertheless tells us, that if the ratio of the nuclear strong force to the electromagnetic force had been different by one part in 10 to the 16th power, no stars could have formed. Now, again, I'm not a math guy, 
But when I see 10 to the 16th power on the page, I know that's an awfully enormous uh, amount of zeros behind that 10, okay? That we're talking about an infinitesimal degree of variance. That if the universe, let me just put it down in Birdsboro, Pennsylvania English for you. If it was just an itty bitty bit different than what it is, we couldn't even have stars. And what does Genesis chapter 1, I think it's verse 16 say? And he made the stars also. Like God tosses that off in one phrase. Some of our brightest minds are studying the stars and seeing how many there are. And I, I got frustrated yeah, a number of years back. I was writing an article on Psalm 8 and, and thinking about David saying, When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou dost visit him? And I thought, you know, it would be neat to put in this article approximately how many stars there are in the universe. And I got frustrated because I Googled it. And like every two years, they kept revising that and kept going out, you know, billions more, not millions more, billions more. And I said, oh, for crying out loud, scientists just don't know how many are out there. A whole lot, an enormous quantity. And yet God is bigger than that. Because if he made the universe just a little bit different, stars wouldn't have come into being. And we wouldn't have planet Earth as we know it. Now, isn't it interesting the way we have people like NASA and now we have private companies like SpaceX that are sending up all these things into outer space, probes and satellites and even some spacecraft that land on planets like Mars. And it fascinates me how excited. You talk about dancing spiders. I mean, that's hard to top, okay? We heard about dancing spiders last night. But when you see a bunch of dancing engineers and dancing astrophysicists. Now, what do they dance about? Oh, we found a couple of crystals on Mars that we think indicates that there once was water there. And they're talking about something that you'd need a microscope to see. And they're just excited as all get out because they know that without water, life as we know it is impossible. So they're saying, maybe if there was once water on Mars, maybe there was some civilization up there, and maybe we'll eventually discover it. But listen, this planet is like three-fifths of the stuff, right? I mean, we've got water all over the place. And, And imagine... How we look at all the different planets, even the ones in our solar system, you know, look at Mercury or Venus or look at Jupiter or look at Saturn, even look at Mars. And none of them can produce, let alone sustain, the life like we have on planet Earth. I mean, they talk about colonizing Mars. They may do it, but they're essentially going to have to take everything they need with them. They can't go up there and grow it. It's not like the the good old settlers, God bless them, who packed their Conestoga wagons, named for Lancaster County. Conestoga is a place there. And uh, they got there in Pennsylvania. And I don't know why they left. It's a nice place. But they came across and and they hit Iowa. And they said, ah, it's the promised land. And all they had to do was plant their corn or plant their wheat or, you know, get a couple of pigs or a couple of cows or whatever, and they were in business. Boom. Next thing you know, they got a farm going. And next thing you know, they got generations of them. And then, you know, then you got the Armstons. And here we are, you know, just the story of civilization a la Iowa. Well, you can't do that on Mars. You land up on Mars, you can't get out and plant your seed and say, oh, I can't wait till the corn comes up. I mean, they think it's nice in Nebraska or Kansas. Wait till they see Martian corn. Now, they're going to have to build themselves some kind of synthetic greenhouse. Hopefully that can stand some meteorite hits and whatnot. But anyway, that's how it goes, right? Because out of all the planets we know of, there's only one where not only does life exist, Life superabounds to the point where we're finding new creatures every year. The scientists are still going into terrestrial places, places on Earth, and finding creatures, usually in creepy crawly places, or they're going down into the depths of the sea or sending probes down, and they're constantly finding more, right? And this is because God has fine-tuned this planet for life. God has made this a planet where we can thrive. Now, look with me at Hebrews chapter 1, please. Because not only did this God create this world, 
and all that we see, the sun and the moon and the stars and so forth. And we know he did it ex nihilo is the old theological phrase, Latin for out of nothing. He created it by his word. Hebrews 11 tells us by faith, we know that the world was not created by things that appear. So it wasn't like other ancient cosmologies, ancient stories of how the world came to be, that, you know, the gods took mud and made it into thus and such, which turned into something else, which turned into something else, and eventually we got here. I mean, basically, evolution is a very, very ancient idea, okay? People have been trying to sell that one for millennia, and it it never does quite work, okay? So the best explanation is the one the Bible gives, It makes sense. Now, Hebrews 1 tells us in verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, or if you prefer, by his powerful word. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That latter phrase belonging more to our subject tomorrow, God's faithfulness and salvation. But why doesn't the universe collapse in on itself? Why doesn't planet Earth run down? After all, we've got this law of thermodynamics that tells us, what is it, the third one that tells us about entropy, that things run down, that energy dissipates. We we have, of course, what the Bible would call corruption. We see all around us, the hymn writer got it spot on when he said, change and decay all around in everything I see. Now, this is not how you start your counseling with young married couples, okay? That's not good. You know, it all downhill from here. I mean, you're getting, you know, you see how beautiful she is, not, you know, you, know, you see how strong you are, dude. I mean, anyway, now my wife is the exception to those principles anyway, but uh, manifestly I am not the exception. Anyway, I mean, in the world, things rust, things wear out, energy dissipates, right? And you say, well, Scientists say, some of them, it used to be when I was a little kid in the 70s, they'd say, oh, someday, you know, we're going to uh, just get farther away somehow and and we're going to freeze. We're going to have a new ice age. And then somewhere along the line in the 80s, they started saying, no, it's going to be global warming and we're all going to be extra tasty crispy like the kernel, you know. And and so either way, something's going to happen or maybe an asteroid's going to come and hit planet Earth. And that's going to wipe us out. Or maybe it'll be the bomb, you know? We'll just kill ourselves in a nuclear conflagration. Now listen, human history is replete with examples of man's inhumanity against his fellow man. And we continue to have a genius for destruction, for hurting people, for killing people. And medical technology, as much as it's advanced and we're thankful for it, we give thanks to God for it by his providence. Destructive technology, though, military technology has far outstripped it. In other words, you you go back through the history of warfare and man's ability to destroy lots of people is very much more developed than man's ability to put them back together. Right. And so there's no doubt if left to ourselves we would destroy ourselves. And that happened once upon a time in the Bible. We read about it in the book of Genesis chapter 6. That the thought of man's heart was only evil continually. And what the world was characterized by was violence. And that people would have destroyed themselves if God didn't intervene. And God intervened and saved eight people. And he did for the world what we call in technology terms a reboot. Okay? You know how you have to reboot sometimes? You know, the great mantra of one of my closest friends is in IT. Actually, two of my closest friends are in IT. And they love to say, have you turned it off and on again? Because they realize that's a wonderful panacea for technological ills. And God said, all right, we're going to start over again. And if you go back and study it, even the language he uses with Noah is like a repeat of the language he used with Adam. Because this, again, is another creation story. This is a continuation in one sense, because Noah comes from Adam. But God is rebooting the world under Noah. Why? Because otherwise, God has to wipe out the whole thing and start over again. Now imagine the faithfulness of our Creator. Having made creation, fine-tuned for life, 
And as this verse says, upholding all things by his powerful word. And Colossians uses a word that says, by him all things consist in Colossians chapter 1. The thought is that they cohere, they hold together. What is it that holds compounds together, molecules together, atoms together, protons, neutrons, electrons, neutrinos, Higgs bosons, you know, whatever there may be at the subatomic level, all of it is being held together by the will of God as manifested through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, my destiny does not hinge on the Kyoto Agreement. My destiny doesn't hinge on chlorofluorocarbons and how much hairspray people use, much less pollution. Now, I'm not saying those aren't issues. I'm not saying they don't do damage to people's health. I'm not saying people don't do things on planet Earth that corrupt the Earth, both naturally and morally. The Bible is clear. When we talk about a creator, one of the reasons people don't want to accept this notion of the creator is they know if somebody made me, then he has the right to tell me what to do. Can you imagine good old Mr. Ford making his Model T? And he makes his Model T there. Uh, Let me update this a little to something I like a little better. Imagine Enzo Ferrari (laughs) making his Testarossa. And he gets in his Testarossa, fire engine red like the old Magnum P.I. And he gets in the Ferrari and he starts it up and he goes to go forwards. He puts the car in drive and it goes backwards. Oh, have to speak to the mechanical engineers about that. Something's gone awry. Anyway, he says, well, uh, I'll try turning right. And he puts on his right turn signal and the left turn signal comes on. And when he goes to go right, the car goes left. And and suddenly the car jets out across the parking lot and onto the highway, going down the wrong way. And Mr. Ferrari shouts out something like, I got a meeting or whatever, you know. And he's very upset. And suddenly the car begins to speak to him. Oh, what's wrong, Mr. Ferrari? Ah, well, I want to drive the Ferrari on the highway. I want to turn the left and you will turn the right. I'm sure he speaks English better than that. Or, you know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we Birdsboro and so we're still working on English anyway. And the car says, well, I don't want to go left. I feel like going on a drive, you know. Well, what would you think Mr. Ferrari would do with such a car? Well, whenever he could get the thing stopped and returned to the factory, he'd march into his industrial design team and say, fellas, ladies, we've got to do this all over again. I mean, start by ripping out Whatever gives this thing artificial intelligence, because it's not doing what I want to do. Now that's how we treat a car that didn't want to do what we want to do. Imagine if you made a creature in your image and likeness, as the Bible said God made man. And that man didn't want to do what you wanted him to do. Well, those who are parents know a little bit about that. Not that we've created our children, But we've been used by God in the biological process, haven't we? And we know the heartache of wanting good things for your children. Chiefly of wanting a relationship with your children. The saddest thing, I think, of people that I know in family situations is when parents and children don't speak to one another. And you sometimes run into that, that that condition can go on for years. And it is heart-wrenching. And sometimes it's the parents, sometimes it's the children, sometimes it's a bit of both, isn't it? And yet, it's not good. Because God made that relationship to be something that helps us, something that builds us up. Now this speaks to the kind of creator God He is. In one sense, people in the world don't want a creator because they say, well, if I have a creator, He's going to tell me what to do. And the assumption is, I know what to do with my life Better than the Creator knows. Now, does a three-year-old know what's better for them than their parents? Well, I don't care about how, you know, they may have just read Parenting for Dummies or something. They may not be the sharpest tools in the drawer, okay? But the parents know more than a three-year-old, okay? Because the three-year-old is going to think, to subsist on central dairy ice cream, that would be a diet most worthy of having. But the parent knows, no, 
for a child only to eat ice cream is going to cause grave nutritional difficulties, right? And that if the child's going to grow and not be some runt like Keith Geyser, they're going to need to eat their vegetables. If any children are listening to this recording later on, eat your vegetables, kids. Don't be a little shorty like me, okay? Anyway, uh, I think it was more DNA than my vegetables. I eat there we are. In any case, the parent knows they need a balanced diet. I mean, the child may think, hey, that's my ball. The most important thing right now is for me to run after my ball. The parent says, no, the ball has rolled into the street, rolled into the street, and here comes a truck. So the child must not go into the street, even if it means that the ball gets run over by a truck. And that happened with a prime delivery truck rolled over the neighborhood soccer ball this quarantine, and children were most upset. But I was saying, thank God it wasn't a kid. <laughs> Thanks, dude, for not hitting a kid. Thanks, kids, for not running out after the ball. You know, we who are parents know more than our children. And we go through maybe a period of our life, speaking from experience as a child, where we think, oh, I know more than mom and dad. But then you come around again to some sort of rational realization. Ah, that's what mom and dad were talking about. That's what they were trying to do. Now imagine that on a much grander scale. That is what God's trying to do with people. God doesn't want to mess up people's lives. I find that people are very good at doing that all by themselves. In fact, left unattended, there's no kind of damage we can't do to our loved ones and to ourselves. Isn't that ironic? I mean, we start out saying, my life's going to be good. I can do what I want. I'm free. And we make decisions that bring us into bondage to all kinds of habits and vices and things we can't break free from. And we find that experience that was described in Romans 7 to name one place that the good that I want to do, I can't consistently do. And the evil that I don't want to do, I, I find that I can't resist that. And I find that I'm in bondage. Like Paul cries out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And the answer comes in the next phrase, I thank God through Jesus Christ the Lord. That's the answer, you see. Because the Creator has designed life to be this way chiefly. That the number one reason we're here on earth is not to enjoy ourselves or not to live the best life as we deem the best life, but the best life really is knowing God. That that's why God created us. In fact, when we talk about creation, we have to think about the fact that God, even though sin has come in and brought a fall, that creation bears the evidence of damage. That it's like the Mona Lisa with a Sharpie mustache drawn on it. Now that happens sometimes, right? Some juggle head goes into a museum and pulls out a marker and figures out that he's going to improve on Rembrandt or Da Vinci or somebody. And he goes up to the painting and he puts a mustache on it. Now they rightly grab a hold of people like that and they prosecute them. That's a terrible thing. But even if you can imagine, you can all picture the Mona Lisa, right? Oh, well, that's not really like it. But anyway, you can picture the Mona Lisa. If not, afterwards, you can find a signal somewhere and Google her. Anyway, picture the Mona Lisa with a Sharpie mustache drawn on it. Now, you'd look at the Sharpie mustache and you'd say, Ah, poor Bob looks in pain. He's an artist, you see. And so even to talk about damaging these beautiful works of art, I know is visceral. It's a painful experience. But you can imagine this beautiful painting, and you see this Sharpie mustache, and you look at that mustache, and you say, oh, I mean, that's, that doesn't belong. That, that doesn't belong there. That's messed up, you know? But you can still see the rest of this painting. Well, look at the form. Look at, look at how it's laid out. Look at the lighting and the shadow. And look at how the spaces are just carefully measured. Obviously, this was painted by somebody who knew art and who made a masterpiece. And someone else has come along and defaced it. And that's like creation, isn't it? That even now, imagine it, we can look at creation in its fallen state. Where we have death, which is ubiquitous. It happens everywhere, eventually to everybody, barring supernatural intervention like the rapture, which is coming, could be today. 
But when we look at the effects of sin and death in the world, we say, oh, it's awful. Coronavirus, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, all the things that can go wrong with the human body, all the weird genetic conditions. I mean, again, thank God that he made us with minds that can discover things, that can research, that can come up with vaccines and medicines and cures for certain things. But it seems like disease is a hydra, right? You remember the hydra in mythology that you cut off one head and you know more heads sprang up right after it? Well, it seems that way with disease. Just when we get rid of diphtheria and smallpox and polio, we start finding out other diseases we never knew about before. And there are some that have just been d discovered in the last decade. And there are other pandemics in waiting that scientists say, oh, if a pandemic ever comes like this one that we can envision, or that ever happened in history, like the bubonic plague, for example, or the plague back in the days of Emperor Justinian, we're in big trouble. As pandemics go, the current one is pretty small from a historical perspective. Now, that's not to diminish anybody's suffering or anybody's pain. I myself have had multiple friends who have now died from it. So I realize it's serious. I'm not, I'm not decrying that. But I'm saying in the mercy of God, it could be a lot worse. And history shows us that it has been worse. Now, even in a world where we have pain and suffering and death and disease, isn't it amazing that at the same time we have beauty? And you don't have to be a Christian believer to see the beauty. Isn't that amazing? Now, go with me a minute to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and we read in verse, sorry, I'll see it. I didn't look it up in this Bible before. I was looking up on the computer, so it's on a different page, a different place on the page. Uh, yes, verse 45. We'll do verse 44 for context. Matthew five forty-four. What I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now isn't this amazing, that in this creation we have, not everybody acknowledges the Creator. In fact, there are billions of people that would have no personal allegiance to the God who made them. That God, we know, has revealed himself through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And they have never bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus. They have never called Jesus their Lord. They've never even thanked him for giving them life, much less for dying on the cross to save them from the effects of their own sin. From not only physical death, but spiritual death, which takes that reason why we were made. We were made to know God. And why don't we know God today? Why don't people have an active, vibrant, real relationship with God? They don't have it because of sin. Ephesians 2 says we're dead in trespasses and sins. The story of that is in Genesis 3. As God comes walking in the garden in the cool of the day, He wants to take a walk with Adam and Eve. He wants to have this relationship with them. Uh, I think of getting to know you. Some of you look like you needed a show tune at this moment. But anyway, uh, you know, God was coming to relate to them. And the Lord Jesus, when he would define eternal life, he didn't talk about streets of gold or how wonderful the father's house was or all the beautiful things that are in heaven or the rainbow around the throne or anything like that. He said it this way in John 17, 3. And this is life eternal that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So our reason for being and why the Lord wants to give us eternal life is that we might have that relationship, that the sin that alienates us from God, that divides us from Him. Sin brings death, and death in the Bible is separation. Physical death is your spirit and your soul being separated from your body. Spiritual death means that while you may be walking around respirating and your heart is beating and your brain is sending off the little impulses that are making your body do all those involuntary things that it's doing right now, all of that's happening, but you don't know your maker. And so God says you're dead man walking. You're a dead woman walking. 
You exist, but you don't know the Lord. Now, what the Lord says here is in spite of that. You know what God does? He doesn't say, now you, sir, you're an unbeliever. You don't believe in Jesus Christ. You've never bowed the knee and called him Lord. So I'm sorry, no sunshine for you today. I know the singer said, ain't no sunshine when she's gone. But that was more poetical, wasn't it? No, the Lord says, he makes his sun to shine on the just and the unjust. And he gives rain, which we need. Go to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Now, the context in Acts 14 is this is part of the first missionary journey, as we call it, where Barnabas and Paul are going around preaching. And here they're in Lystra, and there's a case of mistaken identity. They had this local legend about uh, Zeus and Hermes, the Greek gods, coming down to visit. And so they thought they were come again because they saw Paul and Barnabas heal a man. And so they thought the gods had come down in flesh. But in denying this, Paul says to them in Acts 14, 15, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Now that's what kind of God God is. God doesn't say, I'm going to wait till you acknowledge me. I'm going to wait till you admit that I exist. There was a famous female philosopher among the transcendentalists who got up at one of their meetings in the 19th century and said, I have decided to admit the universe. You know? Well, that was awfully noble of her to really concede that the universe existed. But that was the kind of arrogance the transcendentalists had about their thoughts. (laughs) Anyway, I mean, here are people that don't even believe in God. What's God doing? He's giving them rain and seasons and making the food to grow and giving them food. And and, uh, by the way, speaking of food, have you noticed it tastes good? Now imagine, it could have been if David Bowie were the creator, he could have said, ground control to Major Tom, take your protein pills and put your helmet on. Okay, I'm dating myself, but I was a baby when that song came out, just in fairness. Anyway, God didn't do it that way. I mean, he could have said, no, I had to adjust to this when I got married. Because my wife had been raised in a certain way that, that her mother was a great cook and still is. But they also cared about nutrition. And this was a foreign concept to me. In my mind, there were two questions. Is it good or not? Am I hungry or not? Maybe it was a, 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 you know, sort of a a tangential question. But anyway, (laughs) they think about the protein and the carbohydrates and fiber and all that kind of thing. Well, that, that has its role. That's very important, as I've said. But imagine if you get some sludge that's your protein and you get some sludge that's your carbohydrate. You know, just some kind of formless, colorless goop, something gray, perhaps. And they put that on your plate in the dining hall up here. Would you be really keen on eating that? And they've been doing a wonderful job this week. And I expect the same. Keep it up, folks. It's doing great. (laughs) But where does this come from? God made food to taste good. He gave us the taste buds, the receptors to enjoy that food, right? And when we talk about art... God is the ultimate artist, right? One of the things that Brother Upton likes to paint is he does this en plein air. I'm murdering that phrase, but, you know, painting out in the open air. And I've looked on his website and these marvelous nature scenes that he does. And you think, I love looking at paintings like that. Not just his, but other people in in museums, you know. But you go out and honestly, as much as I love your art, as much as I love other people's art, I look at some scenes in nature that I've seen with my eyes, and I say, you know, even if I had all the skill of a Raphael and a Michelangelo and a Rembrandt, I couldn't do this. I could be a Turner and not do this. I couldn't reproduce this beauty. 
Even if I was like uh, Ansel Adams or George O'Keefe with the camera, you know, I couldn't capture this. This is so gorgeous. I mean, we have digital cameras on our phones, so we do our best. You know, it makes idiots like me even look half decent. We're grateful. And the other ones we just delete. <laughs> but I don't care that the best of our technology can't reproduce the innate beauty that's there. A number of years back, I was talking to a brother now with the Lord who was a very accomplished college professor. He was at the top of his field in another country and world famous and uh, in his in his uh, area of study, at least. And he used to rub shoulders regularly with Nobel Prize winners, with people in the sciences that, that won the Nobel Prize. And he said one of them who was not a believer, who was a committed naturalist evolutionist, He said, you know, the thing I can't understand about the universe is why there is so much beauty. And isn't that amazing? The Lord Jesus used to talk about that. He used to say that you see these lilies who neither toil nor spin. Yet Solomon in all of his glory, you can go back to the golden age of Israel's history. One of the wealthiest men that's ever walked on the face of the earth. And there's nothing they could put on Solomon's body that even remotely resembled that little flower that God has made. Isn't that astonishing? A God who makes beauty, a God who makes food that tastes good, a God who cares about the aesthetics and the sensory experience, a God who made pleasure. Now, this pleasure comes in all different forms, right? God made us, first of all, to be social beings. We all need people. He said it's not good that man should be alone. Now, that, of course resulted in the first marriage, Adam and Eve. But it's not restricted to marriage because it's not God's will for everybody to be married. And our Lord Jesus spoke about that. And also 1 Corinthians 7 devotes an entire chapter to the benefits of marrying versus not marrying in the Lord's work. And depending on which gift God has given you, what he has called you to do, it may be better for you not to be married rather than to be married. And so we have to prayerfully and seriously consider that, obviously, before we're married. If you're married, folks, it's picking and sticking, okay? If you're married, you're you're in it till death do us part, remember, right? But anyway... The point being, we are social beings. And God, as Psalm 68 says, he puts the solitary in families. Now, I know that in this broken world where sin is damaged so much, that there are families that are broken. I know there are fathers that are AWOL, that aren't there and they ought to be. I know that there are situations where there are orphans because mother and father have died. I'm sorry, am I losing my juice? Mm, It's not Okay. We'll pause a moment because this is probably tied to a recording, although I'm also recording it. So uh, don't worry. You'll, if you miss any of the days or you tune out, uh, don't worry about it too much. It'll be recorded. You can hear it again. All right. Thank you very much. But God makes us to be social beings. And I realize that there are situations, as I said, where we have orphans, where we have parents that have died or been killed, where we have divorces, where marriages have broken up, where we have other situations where people find themselves alone. And the beauty of new creation is that in the church, one of the things that God describes believers as is a family. He calls us the whole family in heaven and earth in Ephesians chapter 3. And God is making this family. That's why one of the best things you can call a brother or sister in Christ is brother or sister. We live in a world that's obsessed with titles, you know. I want to elevate myself with this or that title or something. I'm, and uh, I could tell you about a country I go to, and they advertise a lot of church meetings in the newspaper. And it's amazing. They'll have a conference, and you'll have an apostle, you'll have a prophet, and you'll have somebody else who's the right reverend so-and-so. I mean, they put in so- every title they can fit in the advertisement they've got. And I say, what a sham. What a missing out of God's best. Because God says to people out there that are lonely, that maybe their family is broken, that maybe they don't have anybody. God says, come to Christ. First of all, he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, Proverbs 18 says. Secondly, he'll put you in a family. 
He'll give you Christian brothers and sisters. We call it the local church. Now, in this quarantine, a lot of people have said, you know, this Zooming is marvelous. To get online, and you know, it's great. I can go to meeting, and I can have my pajamas and my bunny slippers on, and nobody ever knows, right? As long as I've got the shirt and tie or the polo shirt or something that looks half decent, ladies, whatever you put on, I don't know. But anyway, you know, I put earrings on or something, and then they say, oh, yes, yes, they're dressed up. And I can sit there, and I can get out of bed later, and I can just have the casual morning, and there's no rushing around. And this is great. Now, I understand there's practical considerations, but the church is not a lecture hall. As much as I enjoy preaching and teaching God's Word. It's not just about disseminating information, because after all, teaching, evangelism, exhortation, these gifts are only for a few people in the church, okay? There are a lot of other gifts that the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, 1 Peter 4, and Ephesians 4 being the main passages. And these gifts are distributed throughout the body of Christ. And if we're not gathered together, as was kind of an emphasis yesterday to a number of people's comments, we're missing out on that, right? And part of this is not just to gather together. Oh yeah, I'm seeing Brother Bob again. I'm seeing Brother Eric again. See you next week. And I don't think about Brother Bob or Brother Eric in the week in between. No. The the ideal, what the Lord enjoins on us as the church is that we gather together around the Lord Jesus. And that that flavors the rest of our week. That, okay, maybe we can't gather together the rest of the week, but I'm praying for Bob. I'm praying for Eric. I'm praying for this sister, that brother. They're praying for me. In our day, we're picking up the phone, or we're texting, or emailing, or Instagramming, or Facebooking, you name it. We're saying, hey, how's it going? How are you doing? What have you been reading in the Word? Do you need something I can pray for you about? Do you need, you know, if somebody's been sick, do you need a meal maybe? Do you need me to come over and have a cup of coffee with you? Do you need a hug? (laughs) All kinds of things we can do for the Lord, right? And it's all orchestrated around the fact that God has made these families, which are obviously reflective of who He is. After all, He reveals Himself to us as Father, right? And part of redemption, part of being saved, coming to know God through the Lord Jesus Christ, he gives us the Holy Spirit. And among the other things the Holy Spirit does, Galatians 4 says, he explicitly teaches us to call God Abba, Father. Now, it doesn't have the force in our Western countries that it would have to the first Bible readers. But to anybody from an Arabic culture, or who grew up speaking Aramaic, they still do that in a few places in the world, or who grew up speaking some other Semitic languages, Abba, or sometimes it's said Baba, or terms like that, are the most intimate, special kind of terms between a child and their father. And that's the kind of intimacy this Creator God, who made us on purpose, who made life to thrive, who even takes care of those who don't know Him, and who wants us to have a relationship with Him. That's the relationship He wants to model. That He's our Father, and we're His children. You know, your earthly father may not have been a good one. I realize that's a reality in our fallen world. In my case, I had the inestimable blessing of not having a perfect father, because there isn't such a thing. My father was a fallen sinner who needed the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even as a believer, my father had the same struggle we all have of the flesh warring against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, to put it in Galatians 5 language. But he was a good father who loved me. And at his best, he was reflective of my father in heaven. And even if you haven't had a good father, or even if you haven't had a chance to have a relationship with your father, The wonderful thing is that our God and Father in heaven says, you can have a relationship with me. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. I won't desert you. I've got your back. I'll take care of you. I'll carry you home to heaven. And you'll be with me forever in the Father's house. Now, that doesn't really appeal to people that don't know the Creator God. They think, as I said again, if I give my life to God, all enjoyment is over. But I hope as we consider God's faithfulness in creation. We'll say no. 
The God who made this world beautiful, even though it's fallen now, even though there's been some defacing by sin, there's still so much beauty. He's a beautiful God. The God who made things for enjoyment, like food and art and music and friendship and family, he's a God worth knowing. And a God who wanted to know us so much that in order for that to happen, he gave his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came and died on the cross for us and rose again so that we could have a brand new life, so that we could be new creatures in Christ Jesus. Second Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Well, tomorrow we'll explore that as we think about the Lord's faithfulness in salvation. Father, we are thankful for thy goodness. There's so much more we could say, uh, but we're astonished when we think of the wisdom, power, and goodness of God seen in creation. And yet that God would do something even greater in giving his son for us. That as wonderful as it was to make the sun, moon, and stars, Father, we realize that was nothing compared to the son of God bearing our sins in his own body on the tree. And we're thankful that the power that raised the Lord Jesus from the dead is greater than the power of the first creation. Because the first creation just brought something out of nothing. It was not difficult for thee. But the power of the resurrection showed that everything that our sin brought, every act of rebellion, every lawless deed and thought we've ever done and had, was overcome by the love and the grace of God in Christ. And we pray for anyone at this camp, young or old, who doesn't know him, Father, that the Spirit of God would convict them, that they would take knowledge from those creatures we heard about last night, and that like that spider, they'd shoot that line of faith out. They'd believe thy word and be saved. We pray it for thy glory and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.